Schools and law enforcement keep kids safe on a day when the threats and the false reports would be inevitable. Remembering Columbine's story of resilience for the man who recorded it word by word. Truth testing the claims you're seeing about repealing Denver's camping ban for people who are homeless. It's a shame that you cannot return a $14 million sign because the one Denver bought for the airport doesn't work. Whatever happened to the Jeep that somebody got stuck on South Table Mountain? And this week seems like the perfect week to make more time for your good news. Next. Colorado students are safe today. Want to say that right away following a day when we knew that there would be school security scares. After the shutdown of a thousand schools earlier this week, also the week that we remember 20 years since the Columbine shooting, there were bound to be some issues today, either through misinformation or malice. And there were a few, but again, students are safe. Officers came running at the word of a weapon at Brighton High School today, a lockdown, then a search, nothing found there. Carmody Middle School in Lakewood went through a similar scare. No weapon was found there either. The money being spent to preserve Denver's homeless camping ban sure would have gone a long way to help the homeless. That is not a judgment. That is simply an observation about the sheer amount of cash that is backing the No on 300 campaign. Enough money for two political ads on TV saying that the compassionate choice for voters is to preserve Denver's move along rule. Our politics guy Marshall Zellinger looks at their claims and follows the money. A year ago, this is where my daughter and I were sleeping. The No on 300 campaign, Together Denver, has political ads featuring Natalie and Paul, two people who have experienced homelessness. I know what it's like to live on the streets. This truth test is not about their personal stories. It's about the message they're providing about Initiative 300. The ballot question asking Denver voters, yes, the homeless population is free to camp on public property, or no, the homeless camp sweeps can continue. Natalie's ad talks about getting help from a crisis team. If 300 passes, we may not have gotten that help. It prevents police and service providers from approaching homeless. This is an overstatement, but the city of Denver is concerned about getting sued. The actual ordinance for 300 states, it shall be unlawful for, let's call this next part police and service providers, to harass, terrorize, threaten, or intimidate someone benefiting from the rights of 300. It goes on to say requesting ID by any person would be a civil rights violation unless supported by reasonable suspicion of a crime. So 300 would not prevent police and service providers from approaching the homeless. If they did, though, it's not clear if it would be considered harassment. Allowing homeless people to camp in parks and public spaces isn't a solution. It creates public health and safety issues. There is some truth in the second half of this statement. Just Wednesday, Denver cleared out the sidewalks near the Denver Rescue Mission to address public health and safety concerns. Food leftovers that attract rodents and pests human and animal waste that could lead to communicable diseases and discarded needles. But the city attorney's office told me last week if 300 passes, police would still be able to enforce health and safety laws if there were visible drug use, illegal activity, or unsanitary conditions. Through the end of March, Together Denver raised more than one and a half million dollars, 200,000 from the National Association of Realtors. Why? A spokeswoman told me 300 does not address the root cause of homelessness or provide funds for housing and mental health services. Do they provide funds for housing and mental health services? I didn't get an immediate answer. The Denver Center for the Performing Arts contributed $50,000. The owner of Cherry Creek Shopping Center provided $25,000. Why? They told me Together Denver has our stance. Well, a more specific answer might be because the Cherry Creek Trail and the public property around it go right behind the mall. And the Colorado Rockies here contributed $10,000. I didn't get an immediate response as to why, but I should point out the Rockies also contribute to homeless help. Kyle, they even sponsor a race in June, the home run for the homeless 5K. Marshall, thank you. So Denver voters should have a ballot by this point. If you don't have it, you're expecting one, you can call 311 to check. Remember also, this year, the city is not sending out the Blue Book Voter Information Guide. You can download it online from the Denver Elections website or, again, call 311 and they can mail you a hard copy. It's not a sign. At least it's not a working one. The $14.5 million light-up sign out on the airport along Peña Boulevard, the one that the city unexpectedly got stuck paying for in full, is no longer working. The city's original deal to share the cost of the sign with Panasonic fell through when it turned out that the sign violated highway rules. 
limited what ads they could put on it for the time being. Well, now we've learned that DIA had to shut off the digital LED light posts earlier this month because they are not functioning properly. DIA says it is waiting on Panasonic to come up with a plan to repair them. Colorado's Democratic Senator Michael Bennett is making the announcement of a lifetime. He's cancer free. He shared the good news today, one week after his prostate cancer surgery. Now, as for that other announcement that we are expecting from him, Bennett has said that if his cancer treatment was successful, there's nothing stopping him from running for president. So I suppose another big announcement soon. With all the attention this week being given to Columbine, I did not want today to pass without mention of the 168 people we lost in the Oklahoma City bombing 24 years ago today. Ceremony was held at the memorial site this morning. Members of the community read each name aloud, including those of 19 children. This weekend will be filled with remembrances for Columbine and community gatherings looking to the future 20 years after the shooting there. Kevin Vaughn from our Nine Wants to Know team covered the shooting and the investigation and the community's recovery in the decades since. Kevin took a moment today to reflect. driving there and I was listening to the radio and the initial reports that there had been multiple people shot, that there were pipe bombs going off, and it was just, it was bewildering to be honest with you. And I kept thinking that um, this was some kind of a strange prank or a hoax or something like that. But as I got closer and the reports got more ominous, um, it, it began to sink in that this was real and there were parents who literally just abandoned their cars on the road because uh, they, they couldn't move, it was gridlock, and they were just jumping out of their cars and running uh, toward the school. I'll never forget the image of that. The day Columbine happened, I'd been a reporter for about 12 years. My kids were pretty young. Um, my youngest son wasn't even in kindergarten yet. As a parent, I don't think any of us can imagine anything worse than losing a child. And that's what I always think about when I think about Columbine. I think about those parents who lost a child that day. It is hard to talk about. I was, uh, I was um, thinking about the children who died last night um, at a public event that I was at and I got a little bit emotional thinking about it. And um, I, I don't see how you can't. I mean, it's it's just so awful. The newspaper that I was working at brought in counselors and made them available to us for a long time after Columbine, and I took advantage of that. I think about a woman named Betty Scholes who came out of the school the night of Columbine, late at night, and patiently talked to me and a couple other reporters who were there, and was so kind as she told us about her nephew Isaiah, who had been killed that day. And I think about so many other parents who allowed me to spend so much time in their lives and in their homes. That's what I think about. I think about those people and, and what a debt of gratitude I owe to them for trusting me to tell their stories. Kevin mentioned having access to counselors after the shooting, and we want to remind you that there is always someone there to listen and to help if you need it. The Colorado Crisis Services offers support 24-7. You can call 1-844-493-8255 or text the word TALK to 38255. Some of you, I'm certain, will never forget the 13 names and 13 faces, but for some others, I'm sure they have faded from memory in the last two decades. Colorado made a promise to Columbine to never forget.
At 7 o'clock tonight, Nine News will air a special documentary. Survivors, families of the victims, and people whose lives have been touched by the Columbine tragedy will share their stories. You can stream that documentary right now on the Nine News YouTube page and on the Nine News streaming apps on Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire. A high school senior wrote to heal. I think the song was written in a way that mirrors our emotions. And now it's being turned into music. Let's start the weekend on a high note with your good news. My good news is taking a walk on a beautiful day and running into a moose. And someone thought they had outsmarted the system. But this is not how you Colorado. Next. the effort though from the driver who tried to renew their vehicle registration by just using a black marker to turn a 2017 into a 2019. The Mesa County Clerk and Recorder's Office shared the photo of the close but not close enough effort pro tip. The registration stickers are a different color each year so even if the nine looked better they can still catch you. Another Not How You Colorado update tonight. The Jeep that got stuck on South Table Mountain was returned to its owner today after being towed off the mountain. The driver was fined $450 for driving a vehicle into Jeffco open space where it's supposed to be, you know, just like hikers and bikes and such. Again, folks, it's Not How You Colorado. We started our week with some random Denver history. We'll wrap it up with a bit more. A standoff at our southern border. Not Mexico, the border between Colorado and New Mexico. Jeremy Hohola takes us back to 1936. Denver guardsmen get out guns and head for border. The byline from April 19, 1936 was printed in the Rocky Mountain News one day after Governor Edwin Johnson had declared martial law along Colorado's southern border. The paper reported the governor ordered the guardsmen to the border to repel a threatened invasion of alien beat workers and indigent laborers. Troops patrolled highways, inspected trains, and set up checkpoints at the border to turn away anyone looking to enter Colorado for work. The declaration sparked a brief border dispute between New Mexico and Colorado. Ten days later, Governor Johnson called the troops back after the New Mexico governor there threatened to boycott Colorado products. A high school senior's passionate plea about school violence turns into music. Every time I sing the song, it's like that gut-wrenching, like, emotion. That will be powerful. Then your good news will be positive. Next. I always wanted to show up in this show twice. That was super fun. Mike's back together. Here we go. Fabulous Friday, sunshine and 70s. A nice day today. It goes even warmer tomorrow, but there's a storm off to the west of us. Going to change things just in time for the Easter Sunday holiday. And for outdoor plans, plan on a little bit of rain. Temperatures in the low 60s early on, and the rain will really pick up after lunchtime. Between now and then, though, mild air, winds out of the southwest, bring us a partly to mostly sunny day tomorrow and temperatures are going to be really nice to be outdoors. Tonight, fair skies 47, full moon tonight. Tomorrow with sunshine 78, an isolated evening storm. Cloudy and cooler for Sunday and Monday with occasional light showers moving out Tuesday. Head of a nice warming trend for Wednesday and Thursday. Here's your weekend forecast in detail. Saturday looks to be the pick day for outdoor activities. Uh, again, not an awful forecast, but a little bit of rain on Sunday, Kyle. Thank you, Kathy. Acquired Arvada West High School is preparing for a rare moment, the chance to debut an original song written by a renowned American composer. It's a piece inspired by a former student. Our Nelson Garcia explains. The words they're about to sing comes from a place they know well. Choir director Chris Maunu says Arvada West senior last year, Taylor Huntley, wrote these words after someone wrote a threat on the walls of a school bathroom. A poem about the Parkland shooting and about the, the fear and the uncertainty that, that students feel. He posted the poem online. That beautiful poem wound up in the hands of Andrew Ramsey, a well-known American composer. Ramsey added music and ended up with a hive of frightened bees. 
Senior Kaylee Nguyen and sophomore Madison Major say it's beautiful. I think the song's written in a way that mirrors our emotions. It's panicky and it's sad and it's hopeless and it's afraid, but it's also strong. I feel that it's very important for students to express what they are feeling. Music is really a vehicle to teach about life. You know, the things that have happened recently and we're, we're approaching the, the 20th anniversary of Columbine, I think, I think this topic is fresh on everybody's minds and it, that makes it even more meaningful. For next. I'm Nelson Garcia. Arvada West's Company West Choir will perform the world premiere of A Hive of Frightened Bees at their school concert in May. I think this week of all weeks we could use some good news, and it is a good thing you had plenty of it to share. Just like your feedback, and both are next. I am thinking we are due for some good news right about now, so let's hear yours. It was a hard week, and so it's really refreshing to be out here and to just unwind uh, and enjoy a really amazing day. My good news is that my kids' preschool was closed for Good Friday, and I took the day off, and we decided to come to Golden to enjoy the day. Well, my good news is Chimney Gulch that I'm going to ride. Uh, the weather, uh, I was blown away by how many people were outside in downtown Golden. Pretty surprised, but uh, it seems like half the city is outside today enjoying the weather. My good news is taking a walk on a beautiful day and running into a moose. My good news is that it's sunny today. My good news is that I'm hanging out with friends and having a craft day. Oh, yes, the moose. And there's a moose. <laughs> Hot day for that kind of coat. Cynthia Stone writes in and says, I agree the money spent opposing Initiative 300 should have been spent to help the homeless, but she says it's the people who brought forth such a terrible idea in the first place who she says are really to blame for where the money's going. Brent Olson writes in, Hi Kyle, I'm a 62-year-old Colorado native. Is it me or is everyone in Colorado talking like a valley girl? You mean like this? I didn't notice. See you next time.